classes have been a mainstay of our undergrad curriculum, that's animal ecology, and then he also taught a class called Wildlife and Fisheries Systems Analysis, which morphed into ecological modeling, but that's another mainstay class. Um, but he's also been involved extensively outside of the university system, and that's primarily as a champion for ecological modeling approaches in ecology. Um, he's been involved with the International Society of Ecological Modeling for many, many years. He's even served as president for the North, North American chapter, um, and he's been an editor for ecological modeling for a long, long time. So he's, he's been a champion for uh, modeling approaches in, in uh, ecosystems. So as promised, I brought my beeper, so if it gets out of hand, I will just start beeping him, okay? With that, I'll turn it over. <laughs> which I kind of regret didn't go out because maybe most of you know me, but anyone who didn't, it would give you a little insight into uh, my personality, perhaps. <laughs> but also, uh, if you didn't know me, you might not know this is going to be a talk about ecological modeling. Actually, there are some data, but uh, in the background. So anyway, here was the, the title I sent. I, I find it uh, kind of curious. This is, a, this is the uncensored title. You received the censored title of my post-tenure uh, review seminar. That is the censored post-tenure review censorship tenure. Oh well, that's okay. <laughs> what I'd like to do. I didn't know. Listen. Hopefully, this doesn't. This uh, sense. Yeah, get, get the buzzer. Doesn't doesn't <laughs> doesn't begin. Uh, censor and tenureship doesn't start to fall trippingly off the tongue like uh, jumbo shrimp. Sweet and sour sauce or something like that. If I wasn't on the AM campus, I could say military intelligence. I want to do it. <laughs> Probably not. So, what I'd like to do is uh, use sort of a, a journey scheme for the talk. And I want to go from 2 plus 2. What could be easier? No, 2 plus 2. And eventually wind up with an individual based spatially explicit stochastic simulation model of the role of wildlife in sustaining cattle fever ticks in the quarantine zone along the Texas Mexico border. <laughs> and uh, but as this slide is supposed to emphasize it's the journey, if you will, or how we get there that's the real essence of the talk. Uh, so given uh, if we're going to get there, we need to know just a little bit about that. What, what do you folks know about the cattle feeder tick quarantine zone along the Texas-Mexico border? Well, so without giving away the big ending, right? so the cattle feeder ticks carry cattle fever or Texas fever. And uh, so they come across the border, these cattle feeder ticks on cattle from Mexico. And this is really bad news for U.S. cattle producers because if you find the inspectors find ticks on your cattle, you get quarantined. And worse yet, they go around and they inspect your neighbor's places, which makes you a really popular <laughs> cattle producer. So it's a, a problem. We'll get into it uh, in more detail in a little bit. But that's where we're headed. We're headed from 2 plus 2 to the cattle fever ticks on the border. Ah, and so what the deal is, so the way you can control these cattle fever ticks, the cows come across, dump them in a vat of a kerosene, a, a pesticide, <coughs> done deal. The silver bullet is already in the cartridge belt, we got the answer. But there may be some uh, interesting and pesky details that turn up along the journey that we'll take a look at. By the way, this is a, so this is one journey I've been on in my uh, 39 or whatever the count is now years here. I've been on other journeys that I find always super interesting and 
and without exception, humbling. So what is 2 plus 2 anyway? So uh, for some background, you've probably heard the story, maybe legend, about this uh, young lad. It's a once upon a time, long, long ago, far, far away kind of story. He was a star quarterback for a major college football team. And he was declared academically ineligible for the big game because he flunked his math test. And so the coach, football coach, cut a deal with the math teacher. It's a fantasy story, you know, like that could ever happen in the real world. And the, the deal that he cut was he'd go out uh, to center field, 50 yard line at halftime of the big game, and he'd administer a, a retake test, math test to this guy. This our quarterback, and if he passed the test, he could play in the second hand. And so the halftime comes, and they go out there, and the uh, math teacher says, okay, here's, here's the test. One question, what's two plus two? And so the sweat starts to beat up on the guy's forehead, and finally says, three. And 90,000 fans in unison start to chant, give him another chance, give him another chance, give him another chance. So the math prof says, okay, probably out of pity. Says one more, give him another chance, second chance. What's two plus two? So right now the sweat's rolling down this guy's face, back of his neck, kind of like being right now. He says, Why? 90,000 fans in unison. Say, give him another chance, give him another chance. So, okay, third time, now the math prof's probably fearing for his life. He says, Third time, what's two plus two? Same deal, sweating, he's standing in a pool of sweat. He says, Four. Give him another chance. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with this experience and another math test looming on the horizon, this young lad decides he's going to seek some expert opinion. And so he asks the mathematician what's 2 plus 2. And the mathematician says, well, precisely 2 plus precisely 2 is what you get. Precisely 4. He said, well, okay. But he's going to ask an engineer. So he goes to ask an engineer what's 2 plus 2. The engineer says, well, approximately 2 plus approximately 2 is approximately 4. So when he goes to a statistician, and you can see this one coming, right? <laughs> he asks the statistician what's 2 plus 2. The statistician says, come on in my office. Shuts the door. Sits him down at the on the other side of the desk, he sits down and leans over in a rather confidential tone and says, Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> hey, Dr. Longnecker, where are you? <laughs> All right. Well, I, I try to equally offend here, so uh, sociologist <laughs> next to those two. And, uh, same, same drill. What's 2 plus 2 coming into my office, closes the door, says in a confidential tone, what do you think this was? What do you think it is? Ah, what does it mean to you? <laughs> Last one. By the way, this all has relevance. <laughs> That's the challenge. So he asks the lawyer, what do you think the lawyer says? 2 plus 2 come on into the office, shuts the door. How much will you pay me? <laughs> well, actually, that's, that was the second thing he said. Well, maybe the first thing. Anyway, so uh, what would you like me to convince 12 of your peers that it is? <laughs> well, so uh, keeping up with this uh, what's 2 plus 2 easy answer sort of scheme, this lad's got a biology test coming up, too. And so an analogous question maybe a little bit harder, but who knows. Uh, why do species appear and disappear? If you're looking at a given place, a given time, sometimes a species there, sometimes it isn't there, why would it be? So, continuing with the expert opinion study plan here, we ask a biogeographer. So a biogeographer, I should have quizzed you on this for it. You might talk about things like continental drift, access to a reason, region, dispersal barriers, dispersal corridors, human aid, human aid and dispersal, these sorts of things. Right? Depends, you know, spatial to fall scale. You know, California and part of Mexico is supposed to break off along the San Andreas 
fault and float up and bang into Alaska, right? Keeps me awake. <laughs> so then he asked the climatologist, so what's the climatologist tell him? Why are species there? Why are they not there? The literature's full of these sorts of projections or explanations. You might talk about, again, depending on perspective, you know, temporal, spatial scale, you might talk about ice ages coming and going. I remember when I was a grad student a few years ago, I was interested in the biogeography of mammals. And the book I was reading had a neat phrase that caught my attention. It said that uh, we were currently in the, a post Pleistocene interglacial of indeterminate duration. But you can think of the movie, what was that movie they just had? A Day After Tomorrow movie? Interesting. Also, might talk about what's NOAA? What's, what's NAO? North Atlantic Oscillation, ENSO, mm -hmm. El Nino, Southern Oscillation. They said NOAA. There was a fellow gave a talk down uh, south in front of a group of folks who all know, knew what NOAA is. What's NOAA? National Association for the Advancement of Acronyms. <laughs> so, too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, maybe just right the climate. So, we draw these climate uh, graphs. So potential distribution of species. Maybe they ask a landscape ecologist so what might he or she tell this lab. Well, topography, favorable or unfavorable landscape mosaic, appropriate mix of different landscape types, maybe amount of edge, or these sorts of things. Could ask a community ecologist. Ah, so here you guys know the answer for this. So what's a community ecologist going to talk about? Why is a species here? Why is it not here? Predators. Well, competitors, predators, prey hosts, parasites, diseases, niche opportunities that come and go in time and space, allowing for perhaps invasion of new species. Evolutionary biologists, you might ask, so let's uh, hear it. talk about genetic variation, adaptability, maybe talk about niche uh, evolution or niche conservatism. These sorts of things. So we're we're where are we? Oops, I hit the wrong button. So we are here. Uh, so you don't get uh, too bored and know that there's an end. I've got a little uh, there's six out of forty three you know, <laughs> slides here, so you can keep track. Of it. But we're we're headed towards this individual based model. And so, have I said anything relevant to this problem yet, or not? <coughs> dangerous question to ask, let's leave it as a rhetorical one. But this is the, the challenge to, you know, you can go Google or go to Wikipedia, and you can get tons and tons of facts. Putting them together is the, is the clue. So continuing on with this, so why, sparing Dan's deeper here, uh, do cattle fever ticks appear and disappear anyway. So this four flag took an entomology class or an aquarology class, or tickology. You might don't know why you do that, but you might be interested in uh, how these two particular species, tick species, uh, occur and disappear down along the area of interest along the Texas-Mexico border. And so again, if you ask a biogeographer, he might say, well, you know, these ticks are not native to the Americas, uh, so maybe it's human-eated dispersal. And uh, Wathalus, or uh, the other new name that I have a harder time pronouncing, and I'll skip, right? So what is it, Ripocephalus? Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, Annulatus is native to southern Russia, the Middle East, the Mediterranean basin. The other species, Microplus, is native to the Indian subcontinent. So chances are they came over with human native dispersal. The Spaniards came over with cattle carrying ticks probably in the 1500s to Mexico and Cuba. And then just through human movement, settlement, and, and trade, and they spread through uh, the southern US and California. You ask a climatologist why these ticks are where they are, and you get a typical uh, answer about the distribution being limited by climate. You can't go too far north, it gets too cold. You can't go too far west in Texas, you get the 
too dry area in southern U.S. <coughs> and in terms of the particular distribution of these two species, the microplus is limited to areas of relatively higher rainfall and humidity along the Gulf Coast, prairies, and South Texas plains. The other species you find in drier inland areas in the plains, Texas plains, and the Edwards Plateau. There's a narrow little strip where they're sympathetic right along the Texas-Mexico border. And so why? Well, because the climate's just right. The climatologists would say. Landscape ecologists would talk about the distribution of these two species being in landscapes that are similar to their native ranges in southern Russia, Middle East, Mediterranean Basin, but would most likely refer to the more recent history of land use changes in, in South Texas, you know, in, in terms of um, brush invasion due to overgrazing. So if you read some of the uh, descriptions of that south of San Antonio on down across the river, the border, uh, descriptions of the Spanish conquistadores when they came over. They would write, and early European, other European settlers, they would write about the vast open grassland with really, really thick riparian vegetation along the rivers, big rivers. Not so anymore. You ask a community ecologist, print got small and there are more words, right? Community ecologists are more, more verbose, but uh, might talk about changes in the distribution. We're still talking about ticks, right? Why are the cattle fever ticks appearing and disappearing? Talk about distribution and abundance of, of hosts, native hosts. <coughs> oh, these are big ticks, right? They have to get on big animals, like a cow or a deer, for example. <coughs> Be a meal guy, animal. We talk about uh, distribution and abundance of native and exotic wildlife that might serve as host, increased host diversity, might have provided new opportunities for dispersal and maintenance of the cattle fever ticks. White tailed deer is the main host, the main wildlife host. So, we might talk about what happened to white tails down in well, much of the U.S., I suppose, but the southern part particularly. So they were pretty abundant when the European settlers came, but then there was a marked decrease in population levels yeah. due to European, uh, or due to harvest for wheat and hives. And so I'm squinting to read my notes. I don't want to turn around and my back. You know. uh, and my memory so far, I couldn't remember, it was late 1800s anyway, were uh, reduced greatly but then came back later on the abundance of primary native host, white tail deer. I talk about Neogai antelope, which is a vocal, by the way, not an antelope, uh, as an exotic species of particular interest because they're pretty big bodied, they're about a half a cow size, and they're very widely ranging, they have big activity ranges, and they can carry a lot of ticks. They're also London and populations apparently increasing quite a bit down in the area where these two tick species are sympathetic along the border. Uh, all right, and so Parks and Wildlife in 1996 estimated exotic species in Texas to be about 76 different species of 190,000 individuals. He estimated two-thirds of these were confined behind high fences, but probably a third who were free roaming. Also estimated feral hogs. Well, we'll come back to feral hogs in just a bit with regard to these uh, ticks. Uh, two to four million, note the precision of the estimate, in 2011. And they found, have found seven non-cattle fever tick species of exotic, exotics. Exotic ticks. Pronounce that for me. Exotic, that's correct. Yeah. Very good. <coughs> yeah, have been found on feral hogs. Preparing on, we ask an evolutionary biologist, we might talk about adaptability of ticks to new species. 
with there are a lot of hoof stock, relatively large body antelope and others that may be good hosts for cattle fever ticks. We really don't know. Evolutionary biologists might also talk about the adaptability of C. microplus, in particular, Guacos microplus, to new wildlife hosts in Brazil and in New Caledonia. We've been documented for cattle fever ticks around there. Where's New Caledonia? So where are we in this grant? Is anything relevant yet? Or uh, I like the phrase, onward through the fog, we may be lost, but we're making good time, which we are. So what does all this have to do with Texas fever and the U.S. border? The Texas fever, also known as bovine alesiosis, pyrophagnosis, and red water is caused by tick-borne protozoan, Babesia, the two species that are found commonly on cattle, hegemony and bovis. And way back at the turn of the century, huh, interesting, <coughs> way back at the turn of the century, the other one, <laughs> 1906, uh, Texas fever became regulated a regulated animal disease in the U.S. through the efforts of the Cattle Fever Tick Eradication Program and keeping the U.S. cattle fever tick free is a critical animal health issue that affects the economic stability of wildlife, or, or livestock enterprises, and you could argue wildlife enterprises now as well. But Cattle fever tick invasions from Mexico remain a constant threat. Cattle come across the border with ticks. And the role of wildlife in sustaining cattle tick invasions once the cattle fever ticks have invaded, when you take out the silver bullet and you dip all the cattle, but what's the role of wildlife that may have become infested with these ticks in maintaining the ticks north of the border? So here's a series of maps on the far left to see the historical distribution of these ticks throughout the southeastern and up the Atlantic seaboard of the U.S. and then out in California. The little red area, area, area that you see there is the quarantine zone that's been established by the, by the USDA. This is a, the middle map shows the quarantine zone, which is the border. And an area of particular interest is the Tamaulipan Biotic Province, which is a pretty diverse, ecologically diverse uh, chunk of land, but from fairly open uh, savanna to a fairly thick brush country. The map on the far right labels some of the ecological regions in Texas relative to the distribution of these two species. And so you can see this coastal uh, prairies in South Texas plains, microplus, if you can squint real hard, this is micro plus species in the wider areas and then in the interior portions of the plains, South Texas plains and up in the end of this and the other species annuals and right there is an area, sympathetic area, area of uh, sympathetic between these two <coughs> tick species. So here's a map that I can't even quite squint at to read, but here are cattle fever tick Invasions. This is 1959 and this is 2012. Every year in between, data collected, kept by the USDA. The red bars is the free zone, supposedly. Cattle tick free zone, which is not free all the time, as you can see. And the blue bars are the invasions into the permanent quarantine zone. So. 
silver bullet is uh, maybe not doing quite as good a job as one might hope. And so I, and I was going to mention, I mentioned the silver bullet without calling the attention to the care side again. So the, the standard drill is really two main uh, management programs. One is you dump the cattle in the, the back of the coma floss or, or uh, a care side or spray it on. The other management technique is to take cattle off the pasture, pasture resting. So without the host, right, the single host, takes the guy out. But more recently, in, rather than this single approach, ecological, societal, economic changes, shifting the cattle fever tick eradication program paradigm, towards the concept of more integrated cattle, tick, cattle fever tick. They still use that word eradication. I, had a, I have a friend in Australia who got a fire ants invaded Australia. Got a big grant from the Queensland government to uh, do a big field study to uh, document the eradication of fire ants from Queensland. Think about Okay, well, back, we're, we're moving on down the journey here, but so, and what I would challenge you to do is try to put together all these puzzle parts that I've been tossing out in maybe not a real organized format. I, I see the organization. Right? Can you, so if you were gonna deal with this problem, you know what, how would you or would you use these bits of information? coming at you from different temporal and spatial scales, different degree of detail. How, how, how might one put that together? Well, here's this scheme uh, that I didn't go over on the last slide very much, and, but this is a, a new paradigm of the cattle fever tick eradication program, integrated eradication strategies, the center oval there, evidence base statutes and holistic policy in the upper right, social awareness and extension, interdisciplinary research, ecosystem services, risks and opportunities. Wow, this sounds really cool. Well, <clears throat> if one were to try to operationalize a portion of this scheme, wonder, I wonder what a, a systems approach to this livestock wildlife interface would look like. And so, just a bit about the system's approach to problem solving, development of dynamic simulation models. And so the point of this slide is there is a theory or basic concepts involved in developing a system simulation model. So down the middle there, modeling theory so-called, start with a question and Folks split this up into different number of steps. I like to think about it. forming a conceptual model, quantifying that model, writing equations or logical statements that operationalize that conceptual model, then evaluating the usefulness of the model and then applying it to simulate the scenarios of interest. Along the right hand side of it, which is modeling practice, the idea is that this is not a one and done trip through where you develop a conceptual model, quantify it, evaluate it, run some scenarios, and you're done. But rather, it's a bootstrapping, it's an iterative sort of process where one moves through and re-conceptualizes the system, re-quantify, estimate parameters of new as you're going through the process. And the idea on the far left there is it's really, a, it's, while it may be somewhat apparently sophisticated mathematically in terms of use of computers and all that. A simple process. Conceptual diagram the system, quantify, calculate, check, do some calculations, go back and recheck, re-quantify, and when you think you've got the, the arithmetic in a useful form, project scenarios. Just a bit more on the systems approach and how modeling would fit in with, what's that four-letter word? Data. 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 <laughs> well, it would fit in with the data. 
So here's a little scheme that starts with a, a real world system of interest, conceptualization of this system of interest. And then if you go to the right side, after you've formulated some questions, one might design an experiment to do in the laboratory, an experiment to do in the field, a series of uh, observations to make in the field, analyze these data, interpret them, and draw some conclusions. Well, on the left-hand side, or the your right-hand side, the development, evaluation, application of a simulation model should be complementary to this, no? So you're going to develop a representation, quantitative representation, usually in the computer, of the system of interest. And then you're going to experiment in the computer. And you get data from the computer, simulated data, albeit, but there are data which can be analyzed and interpreted in a similar way. What's lacking from this is probably an error that loops back up to the new questions about the real system or an adjustment of the quantification, uh, conceptualization of the system. But this is the idea. The lab, field, computer experimentation should be complementary and done in an iterative fashion. So just a little bit about some field data that are available or ideas we have, knowledge we have about the system of interest based on some field data. So here's a life cycle of a one host tick typical one host tick as opposed to a three host. I don't know, are there two host tick? I guess it's probably not. Bone star tick, black legged tick, which Lyme disease culprit or three host tick. Cattle fever tick is a one host tick, which means the larva, so we follow from the uh, your left larva get on vegetation and as a host comes by they grab actually they don't grab on. I always had the picture of a tick grabbing on. Spanish tick is scarcapatus, scarcapatus is got his claw, claw feet, you know, more like Velcro, I understand. Anyways, the host pass by and larvae get on the host and uh, get a blood meal and turn into a nymph, get a second blood meal from the same host, turn into an adult, get a third blood meal from the same host, and the engorged ticks fall off. Engorged females will lay eggs from the vegetation catching the larvae and complete the cycle. Just a little bit from the laboratory that we know about the pathogen that causes cattle fever, uh, obesiosis, obesia, hegemony. So if you start in the upper right hand part of the diagram where the cow is, this is a protozoan that gets in the blood of the host, of the mammalian host of the cattle. Tick takes a blood meal, protozoan passes to the gut of the tick and then spreads to other tissues in the tick, so down in the lower right, and then over in the, on the left hand side, coming from the bottom up, the tick will lay eggs, or in order to female lay eggs, and there's transovarial uh, passage of the, pro, of the protozoan, and so the eggs have the parasite as well, turn into larva, and the larva get on the host, the protozoans in the salivary glands of the tick, is, uh, tick is, or in the fluid exchange at the, at the site where the tick is uh, getting its blood meal, the protozoan can pass into the host and complete the cycle. So this we know from laboratory studies. And so again with a little check here to get there. So here's some more information about different puzzle parts. How to put this all together. So what do you suppose a systems model might look like? A conceptual model of the system. So here's one diagram. You can follow the pathogen in the tick and the host. If you uh, squint a little bit. Babesia is in the tick larvae that get on the host. <coughs> the blood meals that turn into nymphs and adults. Adults fall off the host, lay the eggs, hatch in the hatch. Turn what well, eggs do? Hatch. And the larvae turn into larvae and then can infect a, a new animal. So the idea here is a life cycle sort of approach or the conceptualization seems to me like a life cycle 
sort of approach where individuals uh, respond to proximate cues, hosts come by, larva gets on, so on, and either die or, or survive, move, reproduce. So, bam, that's gonna wake you guys up. There's another conceptual model. You may have read about this in the literature. So what's, what's BAM? This is a much more aggregated look at things, but the idea is that there are biotic, abiotic, and movement factors that determine the geographical distribution and local abundance of, of species. So here's another conceptual model where you could place the key players in our system of interest that, uh, and, and think about their distribution and abundance as a function of the biotic, abiotic, and movement factors. So here's a third conceptual model that's kind of intermediate between the, the BAM model and the first one we looked at, where you, you might consider climatic factors and landscape factors affecting this vector-host interaction. And so look at the intersection of these circles where they all intersect, you might expect to find this, this system of interest, the dynamics of this system of interest. So, luckily I have just enough time to tell a story. And again, the challenge is, so what the heck does this have to do with anything that of relevance to where we're headed to this model. So some of you may have seen this Powers of Ten film. It's an old one, it's an educational one. Does that ring a bell with anybody? I think it's in the library. I think it is. It's old, old when I first saw it when I was registered a few years ago. But so it starts like this. Uh, the, uh, there's a camera focused on the area that's 10 meters by 10 <coughs> meters from right to 10 meters. What you see from this perspective is a guy and a gal on a beach blanket with a picnic basket and they're having a picnic lunch. And then the film starts to roll and every five seconds or so, say the perspective changes from 10 meters by 10 meters from height to 10 meters to 100 by 100 from height to 100,000 by 1,000 from height to 1,000 and so on. And so as the picture rolls, as the movie rolls on, you see that the couple is on a big beach. They're not alone. There are other people doing it things you do on a beach, frisbee with a dog and waving and swimming. And you scope back out and you see they're next to, uh, they're in between a big city and a, and a big lake. And you start to see the contour of Lake Michigan. So they're in Chicago or Milwaukee, somewhere down the southeast corner, southwest corner of Lake Michigan. And then you see the contours of North America and the Americas and then uh, planet Earth. And planet Earth disappears. Stars in the Milky Way go flying by, and the galaxy disappears as a point of light. And then they reverse the film, and you go flying, and ah, and as, and as you're going out, 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 up in the corner, the powers of ten are kicking off, right? Ten the first second. So then you zoom back into this uh, original perspective, ten by ten from ten meters, and now you start going in. And the camera's focused on the back of this guy's hand. And you see the hairs and the wrinkles and the veins, and then we go into the tissue and deeper and deeper and deeper. And finally, we find ourselves in the nucleus of a carbon atom. These guys hang. That's it. Movie end. So, of what relevance is any of this to what I've been talking about? Let me ask you a question. So, I want to see reality. I want to see the most real reality. Where do I stop the film? It's going to be another retake at halftime. Okay, that's a good one, of course. Yeah, right. It, it's, you, what are you interested in? What's the system of interest? Right? If I told you what the system of interest is, like the wildlife livestock interface in the quarantine zone along the Texas border than uh, while we were up in Lake Michigan. But you'd be able to 
stop the film at a useful spot, right? a useful conceptualization of the system of interest. Well, so that was the relevance of that, right? So how do you put all these parts together? What are the important players in this system of interest? What, what level of detail do you need to represent the different processes that are going on? in the system of interest in order to have a useful representation of the system which, with which you can address some of your questions. Well, here's what we decided to do for the model, simulation model. So thinking about the climate landscape vector host system, we thought that, well, if we represented climate with three driving variables, forcing functions, three, three variables that affected the system, but weren't affected by the system. We, we chose temperature, saturation, deficit, and, and precipitation, or an index thereof. But this could force the dynamics of the tick life cycle in a, in a reasonable way. And we thought that in terms of the detail needed to represent the vector, the tick, and the host, the mammalian host, we certainly needed to represent the stages in the tick life cycle in the environment of eggs and HS host seeking. These are larvae that are that need need to get on host to get their first blood meal before they die. <clears throat> and over on the host side, the larvae could get on three different hosts of interest to us, domestic cattle, white-tailed deer as the native primary native host, and then current interest in meal guy as a alternate host for the cattle feeding days. And the adults fall off and gorge the adults back into the environment and lay eggs. Interestingly, in time permitting, we could come back to this, but so the, the uh, fecundity of these little rascals when they fall off the different hosts is different. Right? So it depends if you get your blood meal from a cow or a deer. I'm not sure there's info on the meal yet, but we might come back to that a little later, time permitting. So, in terms of the landscape, we thought at the appropriate scale of resolution, we might represent landscape heterogeneity as grass, brush, and mixed brush habitats. Also, at least one of the prime players, the cattle are limited by human alteration of landscape in addition to the grass brush, mixed brush mosaic, there are fences that cattle can't go through. And so cattle, cattle like the grass, they can't go through the fences, but these aren't supposed to. Neil guy are, as I mentioned earlier, are, are bulls, they eat grass, they like grass, they also use the brush, the uh, mixed brush, and uh, deer prefer the brush and mixed brush, but they'll get out into the, the pastures, open land. And then, so here's an overlap of the movement or habitat use of the three different hosts. You got cattle and meal guy that are grazers, preferably spending time in the open, and the deer that are using the brush to get out into the open, and the end zones of overlap. And so here's the, the model that conceptual model that we suppose might be an interesting one to address this question. So how would you quantify the model? So what we did, we developed an individual base, spatially explicit, stochastic simulation model. So what is this? So if you can picture a, a checkerboard with checkers on it, and the different squares on the checkerboard are, ha are habitat patches that have different attributes like brush and grass. And then the, the checkers are cattle and deer, and maybe you need a certain kind of checker for a meal guy, and they, they move around on these squares. And when they move around, they, they drop off ticks and they pick up ticks, which are the only way ticks move across the net. And so that's the basic format for this individual base. The individual hosts are moving around. It's spatially explicit, a heterogeneous landscape with a different checkerboard patches and different attributes. 
<coughs> and the ticks are dropped off, go through their environmental stage, eggs, larvae, they get on the host, go through their nymph adult stages when the hosts are moving around and they fall off in a different spot. And so the detail here is not so important, uh, but I would call your attention of the, so we, we specify landscape characteristics to give these little patches of different attributes. We specify characteristics of the host, so the simulated cattle, deer, and meal guy have a suite of characteristics that are relative to the problem, like the size of the activity range over which they travel, their habitat preferences. And then I would call your attention to this relative rate of tick collection with a question mark. I want to come back to that in just a second. And so this is initialization of the key landscape characteristics and host community characteristics. Then we input those driving variables that I mentioned earlier, temperature, precip, saturation deficit. And then the model loops through these three main steps where the survival rates in the environment of the ticks are adjusted depending on temperature and humidity, essentially. Uh, then the, we process the off-host portion of the tick cycle. Aves, larvae, and George adults survive. Their development rate is also temperature dependent. And then we process the host movements collection and deposition of ticks and the survivorship of the ticks on the host. Well, it turns out, I'm almost there. In fact, in fact, we have a quantitative model. We got the model. <clears throat> the catch is, before you use the model to address your question, you'd like to get an idea how good it might be or how useful it might be. This is without a doubt the most uh, controversial part of the whole process and it's just full of buzzwords. <coughs> the folks talk about verification, calibration, and evaluation. I like to just talk about evaluation. How, how useful is the model? The first step is to verify that 2 plus 2 actually is 4. When you're writing the code in the model, this is a place where 2 plus 2 has to equal 4 or it's wrong. It's a very tedious task or necessary we want to make sure there aren't any impossible operations to try to divide by zero problems in obtaining a solution. Calibration refers to adjusting certain parameter values for which you have uncertain information, such that the uh, simulated data that come out of the model match the field data or lab data as closely as possible. And then validation usually refers to comparing the simulated data to the field data that are available or data from the real system that are available that are independent of those that you use to construct the model. So folks use a lot of goodness of, goodness of fit tests on models, a la stat sorts of statistical sorts of models. But more and more with these individual-based models that tend to be quite complex, the, an idea of uh, pattern-oriented modeling is becoming more and more accepted as a way of evaluating these models. The idea there is that if you can get a model that's fairly complex to generate one pattern of interest, that's fine in the system. If you can get it to generate a second pattern that's not directly correlated to the first, now this is much harder. What are the chances that that's happening by chance? If you can get a third pattern, then chances are that the model is doing something right in terms of the interactions it's put into. What I want to concentrate on, we're getting real close to the end. I got uh, Nova blowing me his watch. So I'm keeping track. <laughs> Dan, Dan uh, got it really long. He was just so <coughs> in the introduction. He was coming big time. What I'd like to do is concentrate on model calibration. You remember the uh, rate of tick collection parameter that I mentioned to you? Turns out we've got, uh, I hesitate to say really good information, but at least there's published information on all the other parameters in the model. The survivorship of the, the eggs and the larvae and the 
engorge females in the environment, the survivorship of larvae, nymphs, and adults on the host, uh, some information on habitat use of the host. The one thing we don't have any information on is the rate at which the cattle pick up the ticks. And so the problem is you've got this humongous number of host-seeking larvae in the environment. So who can estimate that? But the estimates run in the hundreds of thousands per hectare. And then these ticks, these larvae, have to get on hosts. Only a tiny, tiny fraction of them can get on hosts. And so what, how do you adjust that number? Well, so in the model, sometimes the host-seeking ticks are, are dormant. They're asleep. It's too cold. But still, when they're active, there's just this humongous number. So we have, you have to multiply this number, reduce it somehow, from a big number to a small number that can actually get on the host. And so that's what this BHFR, base host binding rate, for lack of a better acronym, we have. But it's really the only parameter currently in the model for which we just don't have a clue. So what do you do? Well, the hypothesis is that white-tailed deer can sustain cattle fever ticks in the absence of cattle. Pretty good evidence that this is the case. And so what we did was to try different values for this calibration factor. It's a factor you can multiply these host-seeking larvae by to reduce this huge number down to a small one. And then run simulations with only white-tailed deer in the model. And see, here are, here are estimates of maximum and minimum number of host seeking larvae over there. Who really knows, but there are field data on that with a huge amount of variability. And we know a little more about the number of adult ticks on deer. Here's maximum number of adult ticks on deer. And so you keep reducing this number. Well, surprise, surprise, the smaller the number, the fewer ticks you have, right? But you get down here. To a point where, according to the model, anyways, white-tailed deer can't sustain the ticks all by themselves. So we're saying that doesn't. We're hypothesizing that that's not the case. So what we do then is pick one of these numbers down towards the reasonable end of a number of adults on the deer. We're on a simulation. Here's a simulation that's run over the peaks of years: one, two, three, four, about five years, with the larvae in the field on the left and the adult ticks on deer only here in the system on the right. And so this is in the realm of the reasonable, might be a little bit lower, but it's, it's not too bad. So far, so good, you might say. Then the problem, and this is as far as we've gotten on the journey, this one, if then you put the cattle back in the simulated system and run again with these adjustment factors, even including the one that we didn't like because was too small for deer alone to sustain the ticks. You get these humongous number of ticks on the post. I mean, they suck them dry. It's a shriveled up cow. And so we, we've got an idea of, so something's missing. Right? And we've got an idea what what that is. Uh, if I fail this defense, uh, maybe on my second try, I can talk about that. But so anyway, on the journey, we're, we're almost there. What I did want to do is show, uh, although the model's not quite ready for prime time yet, the use of the model. So this is kind of small. But what we probably will do, wind up doing, is carrying forth the analysis of different potential management scenarios in parallel with different versions of the model that have different, uh, uh, here, different values of this parameter, this uh, calibration parameter that we have to guess at. So you, you, what we've done here, just to demonstrate the use of the model, is simulating four management strategies. Chief one's uh, removing cattle from tick-infested pastures for 12 months. This is the pasture resting idea. Uh, second is treating cattle with a kerosite every two weeks for 12 months. The third is treating cattle with kerosite every two weeks for nine months. And then finally, treating white-tailed deer continuously which is a little awkward, but they have these uh, four posters, they call it, with deer feed in them, and, and uh, rollers on the posts impregnated with a parasite, so the deer sticks his head through these dumps with the parasite. So we simulated those uh, four policies, and so 
these are all results not paying attention to in the details yet, but the general form, what's interesting is the, the different versions of the model with the different calibration parameters, you get about the same result. You, know? you get a little more spread in the policies here. The other thing you note that no matter what you do, you can't eliminate the ticks from the wildlife, is in a couple of years, you got the infestation. So, like I said, not to pay any attention to these particular results yet. So, uh, what, uh, thank you, uh, is the take home message anyways. Well, I guess to state the obvious to the enlightened group here, there is no silver bullet. But how often do we look for a silver bullet? Dump the little buggers in a vat of kerosene, seal it down. Well, not so. And then, uh, the, the uh, subliminal message that has been uh, flashing through all these slides. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll, you'll dream about that. <laughs> Hopefully, those of you with a vote in the way. So, almost the end, and I got two minutes by Noah's watch. Uh, but I get along with a little help from my friends. This may be the wrong out. I get along with a little help from my friends. Well, anyways. That's just terrible. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> well, so I don't know if the Beatles would approve of this, these edits, but I, I do. And uh, with the, also the purpose of embarrassing some folks, do you uh, recognize the elderly gentleman? They're the one sitting next to the handsome lad in the <laughs> Actually, he's got the red shirt on again, too. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Pete Keel in entomology is a, has been a guide on uh, many journeys since uh, over the last quarter of a century, really, that I've taken to the kick and the country. And uh, he taught me not only the ticks suck, but how they suck, where they suck. It's got great <laughs> colored pictures sometimes. Probably going to want to eat lunch from here. Anyway, so Pete is a, a scholar and a gentleman in the highest uh, sense. He really um, has been a mentor to me in things other than ticks. And he's kind of much older than him. <laughs> Somewhere between, uh, what would it be, 20. Uh, could be up to 47 hours <laughs> older than I am. Anyway, the, the other, you may recognize this picture. You all read ecological modeling, the journal, cover to cover, every issue, right? <laughs> so in a recent issue of ecological modeling, this uh, lady who is a scholar and a lady appeared, I got the Best Reviewer Award uh, over the last two years. Reviewer Ecological Modeling also was appointed to the uh, editorial advisory board. And uh, so uh, Dr. Michelle Chin Wong is uh, the privilege of sharing that office with for the last what, a dozen years. And she's accompanying me on uh, these journeys that I, this journey that I talked about, and uh, several others that have, have to do with ticks and the fishy that are endangered. Plants that are invading the southeastern forests. Anyways, you do recognize who's that? Okay, so uh, the end. Well, okay, a few postscripts. Which, uh, believe it or not, I lost it, but I had a bumper sticker that I had. This. You, you recognize these? Uh, what's that equation? Kirkstead. Sure, Masami's got it for sure, probably some of the others. Well, anyway, so, so if you rearrange the other a little bit, this, the, the equilibrium condition for the lack of Volterra competition equation, it was not a bumper sticker. It wasn't crazy enough to put it on the pickup truck. Uh, and the others you can, uh, can read. 
Thank you.